I've been a police officer for 25 years. Uh, 22 of those years spent in a place known as Skid Row, which is also known as the Mecca for all things homeless in the United States of America. Currently, we're going through a failure for several reasons. Change in laws that has given the criminal element a stronger grip over the homeless community than ever before, and litigation that's tied our hands in creating an environment conducive to change so that the service providers in Skid Row can be stronger than that. Their influence can be stronger than that of the criminal element. Whether we have succeeded or whether we failed, there was always one glaring challenge that we were never ever really able to get a hold of, and that was mental illness or even worse, dual diagnosis, which is when somebody struggles with mental illness, but they're also on drugs. That is a huge, huge challenge. Now, I first came to Skid Row in the summer of 1997. It has always been my experience that when you enter in a bad place anywhere in this country, there's usually about a mile and a half stretch of territory that kind of warns you first. When I first got to downtown LA, this was my experience. I'm driving northbound on the 110 freeway, and I'm looking at the beautiful, picturesque LA skyline, which is the West Coast symbol of America's economic might and power. And I said, that's downtown. It can't be that bad. And I'm seeing people in business suits, drinking coffee, carrying briefcases, smoking on a cigarette to de-stress. And I said, this can't be that bad. Ladies and gentlemen, folks, as soon as I crossed Spring Street, it was if I tripped and fell into Dante's Inferno, Mad Max Thunderdome, Waterworld, any natural disaster movie you could think of, I was there. And I saw some of the most horrific things I'd ever seen in a 50-block radius. I saw trash that was piled up to my knees. I saw people having relations on the sidewalk. I saw people shooting heroin and smoking crack in broad daylight. But the worst thing that I saw that day, it gave me a sense of hopelessness, was to see individuals walking around with hospital gowns and wristbands, walking aimlessly in the streets, not knowing where they were. I knew who they were. They were clearly mentally ill. I got into the station. And my first gig at the station was to work the front desk. I'm introduced to my partner, and he says, welcome to the front desk, Officer Joseph. He says, oh, by the way, Hurricane Linda's out. I said, who's Hurricane Linda? This is where I was introduced to mental illness in the most extreme way possible. I thought I knew everything there was to know about mental illness. My mother and father, father raised 41 foster children. Some of them were on the spectrum of mental illness, dealing with trauma, sexual trauma, uh, physical trauma, neglect. I thought I knew. I helped raise my niece from birth up until she was 33 years old. She also was on the spectrum of mental illness. I thought I knew. I was not prepared. My partner continued. He said, yeah, she just got out the hospital a little bit too early. Uh, she's going to come into the station. She's going to kick over the trash can. She's going to punch the vending machine. She's going to push over the ATM. She's going to throw papers around. She's going to try to rip the phone out of the wall. And by the way, Officer Joseph, she's going to spit in your face. Now, I'm this big, tough guy from Long Beach back then. I was like, I wish a mother would spit in my face, right? <laughs> spit in Officer Joseph's face, right? <laughs> No sooner than I said that, the hurricane comes twirling in to the station. She kicked over the trash can. She punched the vending machine. She pushed the ATM. She ripped the papers off the wall and then tried to pull the phone out of the wall. And then she sees me, the new face. And her eyes got big and she approaches the front desk and she puts her finger in my face and says, you're my little brother. Uh, Ma'am, I don't know you, I'm sorry. And then she puts her fingers up to her lips and says, shh, it's your birthday. I look at my partner. I say, what do I do here, boss? He says, tell her it's your birthday, stupid, so we don't get in trouble. All right. Happy birthday to me, right? No sooner than I said that, her eyes got big, and she smiled as wide as the ocean. And she flew out of the station. She came back an hour later wearing nothing but a trench coat. 
She stands in front of me and she rips open her trench coat and pulls out a giant plush Tweety Bird and slams on the desk. Bam! Happy birthday, little brother. I'm like, thank you, but why did you get me this? She said, because your head is shaped just like it. (laughs) Now, if I wasn't already self-conscious about the good Lord taking my beautiful wavy hair, but really, a mentally ill woman who was a drug addict was the first human being to make me laugh since I got to Skid Row. Linda and I became friends. When I say friends, like real friends. We had a seven-year friendship. Linda depended on me to keep her safe from the birds. I'm like, birds? I'd be in the field arresting drug dealers. She'd grab me on a pant leg. Joseph, the birds, the birds. I said, baby, can you see me handling business over here? Right? (laughs) Didn't care. She needed her little brother. I discovered that oftentimes when individuals are struggling with mental illness, when they're trying to talk to you, when they're talking incoherently, or where they're talking in an agitated state of delirium, they're often trying to tell you their story from within their troubled mind. And many of us walk away understandably. I chose to listen. Now, I listened, but I didn't hear her. She was trying to tell me something. I found out who the birds were one day. I was taking my beautiful wife to a party off duty, driving on the 60 freeway. A big, ugly, burgundy van pulls up next to me. A head sticks out and starts screaming, hey, little brother, the birds got you. I told you, that's my little brother right there. And I'm like, oh my God. (laughs) And when I looked in the front seat, there was an older woman with high cheekbones who resembled her. That's Mama Bird. In the back seat were two young ladies who resembled her as well. I could only assume that they were the baby birds. And they would snatch her and say, Linda, get your butt back in the car and snatch her back in the car. It was their loved ones who would often come down to Skid Row and lovingly kidnap her, bring her home, and try to love her back to health. But that was a challenge because she was addicted to drugs. And oftentimes, she would escape from home and end up coming right back to Skid Row to scratch her chemical itch. And when she did that, it would cause her to not only do terrible things to herself, but it also caused her to do horrible things to others. One day, she sees me in the street, and she says, hey, little brother, I love you. I said, baby, I love you too. She said, I want to give you something. You've been watching over me for years. I want to give you something that's going to watch over you. And she gave me this porcelain angel. I've held on to this for 15 years of my life. I loved her. And I think the first I asked her if she stole it first. And she, she, she promised me she didn't. So, <laughs> so <laughs> I took this angel and I went, immediately went to my locker, opened my locker, and I put it at the top of my locker because I wanted to open my locker and have this angel smiling down on me every day. One day I came to work, I opened my locker and I start donning my uniform and I reach up to get something out the top of my locker and the angel falls and cracks on the ground. I was upset, but I figured, let me go get some glue and glue this thing together. Everything's gonna be okay. As I was picking it up, one of my partners walks up to me and says, hey Joseph, Did you hear what happened to the hurricane? I was like, what does she do now? He says, she ain't doing nothing. She's dead. She sat on the sidewalk in front of our station, injected herself with heroin. And because she couldn't respond, she froze to death. And I waited for him to walk away. And I sat down in front of my locker. And then the tears started to well in my eyes. And then, out of nowhere, I'm punching my locker in anger over a mentally ill woman who was a drug addict, who I love with all of my heart. In my opinion, the system failed her. Failed many others, too. I'll never forget, it's the late 90s, 98, 99, I'm walking a footbeat. We were two of the cops crazy enough to walk a footbeat in the area of Six and San Julian in the 90s, and it was off the hook then. (laughs) 
Now, I'm not the hero in this story. My partner is. I was eating a bacon-wrapped hot dog from Los Angeles Street, and it was delicious. And as I'm munching on my delicious hot dog, we're talking about how horrible the Lakers were. We're glad Shaq and Kobe was here. Things are going to turn around. My heroic partner disappears out of the corner of my eye. And I look, and I see my partner flying through the air to grab a woman who looked like a soccer mom. Mental illness doesn't have a look. And he reached out, grabbed her, and pulled her from the path of an MTA bus. And he threw her towards me. I dropped my delicious hot dog. I'm mad now. I handcuffed her. I said, man, what are you doing? She said, I heard voices telling me to jump in front of a bus, so I did it. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. She said the magic words. Now we can, quote, unquote, help her, right? Took her to the station, had our wonderful mental evaluation unit, talked to her, evaluated her, said, yep, sent her to a contract hospital. We did just that. Dropped her off at the hospital, gave each other a high five. The police saved the day, right? Six hours later, one of our partners comes up to us and says, hey, hey, A-team, you remember the lady you guys saved in the area of Six and San Julian? I said, yeah. Well, she just successfully killed herself with another MTA bus in the area of Cesar Chavez and Broadway. What? Who failed soccer mom? Was it her symptoms or was it the system? I think it's the system. Lastly, I had another friend named Margaret. Long story short, we met. She hated my guts with a passion. One day I saw her at her worst, and at the time I was a young officer. I had no resources, and she said, Officer Joseph, can you help me get housing? And at the time, I couldn't. I didn't know what to do. I said, I hope you get housing, but I don't know. Several months later, she did get housed in one of the most drug-infested housing units in Skid Row. Months later, we get a radio call to respond to this hotel. We get to the third floor, and there are two women who have been stabbed with a pair of sewing scissors. And if you've ever seen sewing scissors, they're that small. But whoever did the damage got to slicing and dicing. And I looked down the hall, and I saw my friend Margaret sitting like a child with her legs crossed, bloody scissors in one hand, empty crack pipe in another, and an empty bottle of pills in her jacket pocket, bragging about how she just killed two alligators that broke into her friend's room, not realizing that they were her friends. Listen, I know from a public safety and a legal standpoint, I had no choice but to send her to prison. But I'm telling you as a police officer and a man that that was morally wrong. Someone should have helped Margaret long before. We had many people on the spectrum of mental illness who fell in the loving arms of family who did the best they could to help them and love them back to health. And it's a struggle. It's real. It's real. But you had many who were either dumped in, shoved in, or wandered into places like Skid Row. And here's what happens to them when they get there. They stop taking their prescribed medication. You know why? Because it makes them feel down, lethargic. And in Skid Row, it's what my son used to call turned up. You can't be down in turned upville, all right? So they would give away, sell their prescribed medication to make money to do what? Self-medicate on the hard stuff, crack cocaine, methamphetamine, and other drugs. And that would exacerbate their conditions 100-fold where they then became a police problem. Listen, it's not a a, a police issue if you're mentally ill. It's not a crime to be bipolar. It's not a crime to be paranoid schizophrenic. Not at all. But when those things meet drug addiction, it can have disastrous consequences. And who do they call when it happens? The police. The tip of the spear. And we get there with our badges and our handcuffs and all these other tools. And everybody says, why don't you get a clinician to go with you? And our clinicians are wonderful. But many of them won't even approach them. And how do you expect us to fix it and even our wonderful mental health clinicians, when there's a chemical buffer between us and the crisis at hand. It's a challenge. Here are the tools they give us to help people struggle with mental illness. 5150 or 5152 of the Welfare and Institution Codes, where they, we are able to hospital, detain them and hospitalize them for 72 hours or less or two weeks in extreme cases. Let's show you where that fails. Anybody here ever try to get washboard abs? <laughs> Think you can get a six-pack in 72 hours or less? 
I'm going to tell you no because I've tried that before I came here and it didn't work. <laughs> it takes days, weeks, even months to get those re results. So how can we realistically or humanely believe that we're going to help someone on a spectrum of mental illness or even worse, dual diagnosis in 72 hours or less? Listen, it takes six weeks for the average person to benefit from the therapeutic attributes of their prescribed medication. So you can't expect that to stabilize them in 72 hours or less. Listen, I know I'm just a street cop. I do not claim to have all the answers. But I do have some suggestions based on 22 years of dealing with the people I care about in Skid Row. It should never be 72 hours or less, especially when they're in crisis or dual diagnosis. It should be six weeks, and here's why. You have to detox them first. You gotta detox them so they can hear you. Then after you detox them, develop a rapport, give them their medication, stabilize them, and find out who their loved ones are so we can reunite them with their loved ones. The next step is we have to ask our politicians to streamline and quicken the process of conservatorship because it's too long and it's too late, okay? Lastly, we should never put anything recovery related in dangerous places, crime ridden places like Skid Row. It's wrong. You're not giving them a fair chance. How can you rehabilitate when the person preying on you is not only outside the facility, but sneaks in as well? Listen, this is what we need, and I'll end here. We need our politicians our first responders, police officers, firefighters. We need our wonderful mental health clinicians and yes, civil liberties groups to come to the table with intentionality in solving this serious crisis, to avoid ourselves of partisanship, finger pointing, blame, and let's come together and solve this problem in a real way. What you're hearing is not from the perspective of a police officer, we need to stop that. What you're hearing is from the perspective of a human being who happens to be a police officer who cares about these individuals like nobody's business. I thank you for listening. Rest in peace, Linda.